ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the main event. Let's get ready to rumble! celebration tonight and I just was telling you, next week I'm hoping we can get the fog machine going and uh, we're really going to make this thing happen I'll tell you uh, if you're new with us we try to do something like this every week but uh, now this is really the first time but we figured today will be the only church in Germany that probably had that opening for the the sermon time and so our little claim to fame but you probably didn't expect that today but we wanted to set that up because I hope that you are ready to rumble tonight. By that I mean I hope you're ready for the greatest wrestling match in human history. And we're going to talk about, we're going to consider that this evening. Uh, we're going to explore it tonight. We started last week this new series we're calling Wrestling with God. Josh did a great job last week of introducing us to a guy by the name of Elijah a man, a prophet of God in the Old Testament who wrestled with God. Elijah did some great things in his life. God used him in amazing ways. But Elijah never quite felt that he had God's full attention, God's full presence. He always struggled with the presence of God. And so we saw how Elijah wrestled with God. We're going to be looking at different characters, biblical characters, and the circumstances of their lives over the next three weeks as they wrestled with God. And tonight... We're going to come to probably the classic wrestling match in the, new, in the Bible with God. We'll look at that in a moment. Uh, maybe you can relate to wrestling with God. It's a strange season of life. It's a season of life when uh, we put together faith and doubt, expectation, disappointment, hope, hopelessness. Maybe you never thought it was okay for a follower of Jesus to wrestle with God. You felt like you wanted to, but you didn't know that was acceptable. But I'll tell you, most of us have been at a place like that. Maybe you're there tonight, or maybe you have been, or you will be. The reason is because none of us have lives that are lived in a straight line. Nobody's life is always up and to the right on the graph. We wish it was so. It's just not the case. We all experience some ups and downs in life. Sometimes life is going so well in the right direction, we couldn't be more excited about it. And then it feels like we're on a roller coaster, and all of a sudden we hit that unexpected curve. And it jerks us in a different direction, takes us to a place we never thought we'd want to be, not sure we can survive, and we're headed in a place that we don't like, it's not pleasant, and we're not sure what to do about it. For followers of Jesus, when you get to a place like that, you find yourself in a place you never thought you'd be. It's a time to wrestle with God. I'd say most of us have been there. I certainly have. Me too. We've been there at a place where we say, God, I'm not sure what to do here. When, and when we wrestle with God, it's something that both followers of Jesus do and those who aren't followers of, of Jesus. And maybe you're here tonight and you say, I'm not a follower of Christ, but I wrestle with God. I, I wrestle with the fact that He even exists. Is he good? Is he loving? Uh, who is he? Is he always angry at me? Is he always blaming me? I wrestle with God in many ways. I'd say across this room, we have people wrestling with God in every way possible. When we wrestle with God, it's not because necessarily we don't believe in him or we no longer believe in him. When we wrestle with God, it's because we do believe in him. We believe in him and we know that he can help us in our lives, in every circumstance of life. But the way he's working in our lives or not working in our lives doesn't seem to measure up to what we expect or want from him. And we wrestle with God. We say, God, I don't get how you're doing this. We come to the place where we say, God, if I were you, I would do it this way. I've been there. I've, I've bargained with God before. I say, God, why don't we just trade places? for a little while. 
Let me fix some of the things that I think ought to be fixed. Let me deal with some of the people that ought to be dealt with. Let me handle things the way God ought to handle them. We wrestle with God in terms of how He's working or not working in our lives according to our expectations. When you go through that season of wrestling with God, I want to tell you, you're not alone. It's not an easy place to be, but it's a place that we've all been. In fact, I would suggest that we'll all get there at one time or another in life, and we're not the only ones. That's the story, I think, of God's people throughout history. People of God have wrestled with Him, who He is and the way He works, and their expectations and their hopes and their disappointments and all that goes with that. It's the story of God's people. In fact, I'd say probably most of the people we meet in the Bible, Old Testament and New Testament, most of them, part of their story in the Bible is when they wrestled with God. They brought their own struggles, their own questions, their own doubts to Him. And today I want us to take a a look at one of the all-time great legendary wrestling matches in the Bible, in both Old and New Testaments. It has some important lessons, I think, for us to learn in our own lives of our wrestling with God. So, in fact, when you think of those who have wrestled with God, don't say it out loud, but think to yourself, what's the, the classic wrestling match in the Bible of someone who struggled with God? So think about that. I'm going to ask you to help me name that person. It would be interesting to see what names come out to your mind. The classic wrestling. I can think of one from the Old Testament and one from the New Testament. But on the count of three, say out that name of the classic legendary wrestling match with God, will you? One, two, three. Jacob. I heard lots of Jacobs. Probably another one, if you looked at in the New Testament, would be Jesus wrestling with God. And the cross and at Gethsemane. Well, that's the classic one we want to deal with tonight is this wrestling match that Jacob, an Old Testament character, had with God. It kind of defines the category of wrestling with God, I think. We find the uh, story of Jacob in the Old Testament, in the book of Genesis, the first book of the Bible. In Genesis chapter 32, if you have your Bible with you, we'll be looking at that in just a couple of minutes. You can turn to Genesis 32. <clears throat> the story begins in verse 22. We'll read it in just a minute. But let me tell you a little bit about Jacob, in case you're not familiar with him or can't quite remember where he fits in the story or or what his life was about. Let me set the stage. Now, I'll admit up front that Jacob is probably my least favorite character in the Bible, (laughs) Old and New Testament alike. He's not a kind of guy that I'd probably want to have as a friend. If I had a daughter... He's not the kind of guy I would be excited, me or my wife, to have my, our daughter come home and say, Dad and Mom, I want to introduce you to Jacob. If you have daughters and your daughter brought a Jacob home, you'd say, do you think you might be able to keep looking for a while? <laughs> He's not the kind of guy that we think you, you ought to marry. Because Jacob, Jacob had a lot of deficiencies in his life. He was a schemer. He was a con artist. He was a blamer. Uh, He lived a life of shame and regret. He was filled with insecurity, but uh, outwardly he had this compensating pride that he exuded. He was a liar. He was a manipulator. Uh, Jacob was a ruthless man who wanted to live life on his own terms, not God's. Jacob always wanted his fair share and a little bit more. And he would go to almost any extreme to get that in life, to make sure he was number one at the top of the list. An amazing thing of his life, not only did that affect him, but he reproduced those dysfunctions in his whole family. You read the story of his family, of all of his kids, sons and daughters, they all had this family dysfunction of struggling, of wrestling with each other in their relationships. And I suppose that you, like I, over the years and course of life, you've probably known a few Jacobs. <laughs> Maybe there'd be some here even this evening who'd say, I'm, I'm a Jacob. There's a lot of things in my life like that. I've struggled to get my fair share and then some, and I'm that kind of schemer, that kind of person in life. But one day, in the story, as the story goes, Jacob was confronted with all that mess in his life. 
all that baggage, all that garbage. That day, literally that night, was a night when God sent his angel, the angel of the Lord, to come and to wrestle with Jacob about all that stuff. And in that, Jacob came face to face with his own broken humanity, with his own sin, with his own weakness, his own fear, his own failures, his own personal demons. And out of all of that, as Jacob laid it all out all night long in that wrestling match with the angel of God, he learned that God was stronger and more capable than he ever thought possible, that God could handle all the stuff he threw at him, all the junk of his life. And he began to depend in a new way, a fresh way, on God's presence and on God's power and on God's healing and on God's grace in his life. And his life was forever changed by that wrestling match. And he would bear the mark of it for the rest of his life as he finally discovered something about God that he never thought possible. So I hope that you're ready to rumble. I hope you're ready to walk with Jacob through the wrestling match, the uh, epic wrestling match in the Bible. We read, at, it, we read of it in Genesis <clears throat> chapter 32. It begins in verse 22, and I'll just read that. You can follow along in your Bible or your device if you'd like, or just listen to me. The story starts in verse 22, that that night... Jacob got up, and he took his two wives and his two female servants and his eleven sons, and he crossed the ford, the brook of Jabbok. And after he had sent them across the stream, he sent over all of his possessions. So Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him till daybreak. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. And then the man said, Let me go, for it's daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. The man asked him, what is your name? Jacob, he answered. And then the man said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with humans, and you have overcome. And Jacob said, please tell me your name. But he replied, why do you ask my name? And then he blessed him there. And so Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, It is because I saw God face to face, and yet my life was spared. And the sun rose above him, and he passed Peniel, and he was limping because of his hip. And therefore, to this day, the Israelites do not eat the tendon attached to the socket of the hip, because the socket of Jacob's hip was touched near the tendon. The picture of Jacob's wrestling with God that little snapshot, but it's, it's really a snapshot that uh, expresses the whole the entirety of Jacob's life to this point, because his, his entire life had been a life of struggle, a life of wrestling. He struggled with his brother when they first were born. He struggled with his father, with his father-in-law, with his wives. The essence of his struggle was Jacob was always searching for something that he was never able to find. He was always searching for, from the people, a pronouncement of, of, of uh, that he was okay, that he was accepted, that he was good enough the way he was. And Jacob sought that from everybody he encountered and always caused strife and brokenness in his relationships. He sought that blessing from his brother, from his father, from his father-in-law, from his, his wives, from everyone he encountered. Jacob sought to be blessed by them to be pronounced okay. He sought that from everyone except God, the only one who could really give him what he was looking for, the irony of it all. The blessing that he really needed over all the others was God's blessing. But Jacob wasn't wise enough to seek that blessing. And he wouldn't realize that until God sent this angel of the Lord that night to wrestle with Jacob. It was God's angel, God's representative who came to him, who conveyed God's blessing, finally, upon Jacob, the blessing he'd he'd been looking for for his whole life from everyone else except for God. And as we look at that this evening, I I want us to consider some aspects of that story that I think uh, will help us in our wrestling with God. They'll encourage us to know what we can gain from our own wrestling. Those matches when we bring come to God and say, God, 
I need something from you and from you alone that I can't find from anyone else. There's certain aspects of Jacob's wrestling match that apply to our own. And the first one that I noticed here is at the very beginning of verse 22, we discover that Jacob wrestled alone with God. Did you catch that? His family, his possessions, all his people, he'd sent them on ahead. Jacob had to wrestle alone. It's interesting that there's no, when we do business with God, some business we do with God can be done in the context of people and groups and studies. But some business, some wrestling with God, we do one-on-one. No one else can do it for us. No one else can accompany us. And Jacob found himself all alone with the angel of God. His family had gone on ahead, and he wrestled alone with God. We wrestle with God. Sometimes we have to bring to him our own brokenness, the messes of our lives, the baggies that we've been carrying, some that we've created ourselves, all of that stuff to him. We have to find the courage to bring it to God on our own, one-on-one, just as Jacob did. No one else can do it for us. Not parents, not a pastor, not a best friend, not a spouse. We alone have to bring that stuff to God. Oh, friends and support groups, they can pray for us and encourage us, help us, support us. But we have to wrestle with God alone with those issues of life, those deep issues. And that takes courage. That takes a willingness, a humility to be broken before God and to say, God, you know this stuff anyway, but I'm going to lay it all out on the table. I'm going to lay it out, my questions about you, my doubts, my struggles, my disappointments, my anger, my frustrations, all the things that I've never really said to you, God, I need to lay those out and wrestle it through with you. Find out who you are how you work, and what you're doing in my life. When we do that, God doesn't reject us. God doesn't blow us away. God doesn't shame us and tell us to leave Him alone. We bring Him our struggles, our doubts, our disappointments. In fact, He welcomes us. But, as Jacob learned, God doesn't back down. God, in the end, makes sure that we know, after that wrestling, that He is God, not us. That he's in charge, not we. And our wrestling must lead to our dependence upon God for his blessing, just as it did in Jacob's life. And so when we wrestle with God, we need the honesty, the boldness, the humility to come and say, God, I need to deal with you. I need to pour it all out. I need to tell you, here's what I've been looking for. Here's the the wounds and the hurts and the heartaches of my life. Here's what I've been seeking from everybody else. And God, maybe... I need to find it just from you when we do that alone, one-on-one. And then the second aspect of the narrative that really strikes me is specifically what Jacob was looking for, and that is God's blessing. He looked at it for it from everybody else except God, but what he really needed was God's blessing. Every person needs God's blessing. But we all look for it. We all want to be blessed in life. We want to be blessed by the people we're engaged with. Uh, We need it from our parents, our friends our teachers, our colleagues, our bosses, all the people that we're engaged with, every person needs from outside themselves the assurance from others that we're of value, that we're accepted, that we're okay. But the problem develops when we substitute the blessing of people on that human level for the blessing of God on the divine level. God's blessing supersedes all of those human blessings. When you do that, it cripples you. It'll cripple you as a person, It'll cripple you as, a, ch- as a, a church because ultimately people and churches, we need the blessing of God, not just the blessing from one another or a denomination or a leader, but God's blessing. So what is God's blessing exactly? I think it's important that we understand that. Essentially, God's blessing is His pronouncement over us that we are loved and accepted and we're recipients of His unmerited grace. That's God's blessing that He pronounces over each of us. If you want a full biblical description of that, you want to study it for yourselves, Ephesians 1, 3 to 14 is a powerful description of the blessing of God that He gives to people. We won't look at that now, but it's a great place to read and consider later on. Once we experience and live in God's blessing, our striving ceases, and we can live in it the rest of our lives. 
And we can get a balance between seeking the blessing of others, but knowing that we have the blessing of God, God's grace that supersedes all the others. You see, God's blessing gives us value and the assurance that we are His. It gives us hope that we don't have to earn His grace, that we simply receive His grace as a wonderful gift from Him, that we don't have to be good enough. One of those people who were baptized this morning, one of the gals said that in her journey toward God, she finally gave up. And she got mad at God, and she said, I, I mean, she really got mad at religion. She said, I, I know I could never be good enough. I always lost. I could never check enough boxes. I could never earn God's pleasure and God's blessing. And so I finally just said, forget it. I'm going to do life my own way. And then she hit bottom. She discovered it wasn't about earning anything. It wasn't about being good enough. It was simply about God saying, you're accepted as you are. I love you the way you are. My grace covers you. I take you just as you are for all the stuff you've done, all the places you've been, all the baggage you carry. I'll take you just as you are. She said that was the turning point of her life. True for Joseph or Jacob as he discovered God's blessing wasn't something he had to earn, something he simply received. God gave it to him, gave him value and assurance, knowledge that even in his unworthiness, he was good enough for God. He didn't have to earn that. It was by God's grace. He simply had to hold on to God and the power of his blessing. I need that. You need that, don't you? We need to know that God accepts us as we are. The Bible calls that grace. And the final aspect of this narrative that <clears throat> strikes me is that after Jacob wrestled with God alone and he received God's blessing, this whole story involved two other elements. It involved a, a wound and a name, interestingly. The story ends with that. You see, until this wrestling match, uh, Jacob's life, as I've portrayed it, has been a, a mess. Quite tra- it's been a tragedy. But on this night, the direction of his life changed because of God's blessing. He's not perfect from this point on. Moving forward, there's still some issues of life. But you read the rest of his story, the rest of Genesis, and you notice a distinct change. He's different. He's a changed man. He's now at peace within himself. He doesn't have to fight for his own right. He doesn't have to be good enough. He's good enough for God, and God's grace has changed this man. And to mark that, God gives Jacob first a wound and then a name. A wound to remind him that he always will be in need of God. And it's significant where God wounds him, the the angel wounds him. Jacob was wounded in his hip joint. The hip joint is the strongest joint uh, of the body. And I think there's significance in that as to why the angel wounded him there. Because I think we wanted Jacob to know, Jacob, even in your greatest areas of strength, where you can do it and you need no help from anybody else, I want you to know you're still, even in your greatest area of strength, dependent upon God. You must be. And if you ever forget that, you will go back to your scheming, striving ways. If you ever stop relying and being dependent upon God. And so it is for us in our lives. When God blesses us, we realize that we can depend on on Him in every area of life. It's His from the beginning to the end, from the weakest to the strongest part of life. We rely upon Him and His grace and strength. And then to seal the deal that God gives Jacob a new name. His old name, Jacob, means heel grabber or usurper or schemer. And that's what he was. From the moment of his birth, Jacob was always trying to get his due and a little bit more. And whatever ways he needed to do, he would take those. So God says, well, we're going to change your name from Jacob, a heel grabber, to Israel, a God wrestler. That's maybe not a, a great improvement on names, but it's significant because he says, you go from a heel grabber to a God wrestler. And I want you to remember, anytime somebody says your name, Israel, it indicates that you are now forever connected to God. And you have his blessing. It comes back to this night of when you wrestled with him and you poured it all out and you discovered that he could handle it. He didn't send you away. He didn't crush you. He received you. But he made sure that you knew he was God and you, not, you weren't. And so God gave him a new name, Israel, people of Israel. That's who they're named after. This guy, 
who once was a schemer and a con artist, but became a man after God, a God wrestler. You know, when we, when we wrestle with God ourselves, we too learn that He can handle it. He doesn't crush us. He doesn't rebuke us. He doesn't shame us. He doesn't send us away. He blesses us. He gives us a new name. He gives us a wound so that we always walk with a limp, perhaps. But He gives us a new name as a reminder of what His blessing is all about. The Bible says that new name is we're called Christians. We're His children. We're little Christ. We're followers of Jesus. It reminds us from then on that we are dependent upon Him, that He has blessed us. And it's not dependent upon us, but upon His grace and upon His strength. So what do we learn from Jacob's wrestling match with God? If I could put it in a, a sentence, a, a single lesson, I, I'd put it like this. I'd say that into our brokenness, God wants to bring the blessing of dependence on Him. God knows we're broken people. He doesn't have to wait for us to tell Him, but sometimes we need to tell Him, God, You know my wounds, my brokenness, my struggle, the battles of my life, and God receives those, and He works, allows us to work those through with Him and to trust Him. And then He says, now, as I bless you, as I accept you for who you are, be dependent upon me. Live life under the umbrella of my protection, of my principles, and my guidance. Life just works better that way, the Bible says. So I wonder, do you need to wrestle with God? What do you need to wrestle with Him through? Maybe it's in your own life. You need to know God's blessing. You need to find His grace. Maybe you too have said, I'm just tired of trying to check all the boxes, never feeling like I'm good enough never feeling like I've done enough, that I'm okay as I am. I'm always trying to please God, and I never get to that place. You need to discover that it's not about that. It's about God's blessing, God's pleasure, God's grace. It says, you are enough right as you are. My son died for you as you are. In all of the mess of your life, in all the sin and all the failures and all the stuff you've done, God says, my son died for you to take care of that stuff to give you forgiveness, to redeem you from that, to give you a fresh start, to let you know it's not about what you can do. It's about what I have done in the person of my son Jesus who died on the cross, who paid the penalty of your sin. Maybe that's the wrestling match with God that you need, where you need to start. Say, God, I just need to come to you and find out what that's about and yield my life to you and receive you as my own Savior. Receive your penalty or your payment of the penalty of my sins that I owe, but I can't pay. Just as these people who were baptized today proclaim publicly that they have found that blessing, that grace through depending upon God. As his child, maybe you've made that discovery, but you've been bogged down by some of the stuff of life. God hasn't performed the way you thought he should. Quite honestly, you said, God, I don't know why you've done what you've done in my life and why you haven't done some of the things I thought you should do. God can handle it when you bring that to Him. God wants you to wrestle that through with Him and say, God, I need to really understand how it is you work, and I need to learn to trust you no matter what comes, to understand, to believe that the the truth of the Bible that says God works all things together for good, that God has a good plan, and we can trust Him to work that plan out in and through our lives, through the various turns and twists and upside-down times, God can be trusted with all of life. We can depend upon Him. Whatever you need to wrestle through with God in these two or three weeks that we're together, we want to give you permission to do that. And I hope that you'll learn from different characters, that different issues that can be wrestled through. You know what yours are, and God can handle it. God says, bring them to me and discover what I can do in your life. If you need blessing, remember Jacob. He looked everywhere else for it. They only found it, though, truly found it, in the presence of God. So he discovered for himself how he could depend upon God's unchanging grace, God's unconditional love and acceptance. And so it is for our lives as well, that into our brokenness, God wants to bring the blessing of dependence upon him. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for this guy, Jacob, such an interesting character, 
a guy who's uh, not the most pleasurable character in the Bible, but a man whose life you changed. A man who, out of the sourness of his life, you brought a sweetness and a dependence that can be seen on the pages of the Bible. Lord, we need that. We have stuff in our lives, and we need to wrestle through with you. Many of us have disappointments with you about how you've dealt with this, or how you've dealt with us, or how you've handled one thing or another. And God, we need to wrestle that through with you, and to discover that your grace will cover all of that is sufficient for us, and you will help us understand and learn to depend upon you and to trust in you. And I pray, Lord, across this room tonight, uh, there, some maybe have come tonight and they just say, yeah, I, I've always thought I had to be good enough. And I realized I could never make that. And I've become frustrated and struggling and lived in shame and lived in blame and guilt. And God, I pray that you'd help release them from that to discover it's not about what they can do. It's about what you have done in the person of your son, Jesus. Lord, help us. Help us to come to you and open our hearts, open our lives, lay it all out on the table and over these weeks to let you deal with us in the the core of our hearts and the issues of our lives, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, thanks for being here tonight. And maybe you're here and you say, I just like to, something that we've talked about or God's nudging you, you just like to have somebody pray for you or pray with you or over you, our prayer team will be up here at the close of the service and they would be happy to do that. If you'd like to come up and privately, they'll be happy to, uh, glad to do that. Cafe will be open, so if you can hang out for a few minutes, say good evening to some people, meet some friends, some new friends, love to have you do that. Great to have you here. Thanks for being here. God bless you. Have a great week. See you next Sunday.